Hello, everyone. I hope you're all doing great. Okay, so I'm going to be yapping a little bit before we begin the audiobook. Please feel free to skip this part and go straight to the audiobook. I will have the timestamp in the description and in the comments section below. So, out of all of Corbett's stories, the hunt for the Kanda man-eater is probably the most unusual, in the sense that it lacks the kind of details that we've come to expect from Jim Corbett's stories, uh, which is why I thought that it is incumbent upon me to fill in the gaps just a little for the listener who isn't really familiar with the previous stories or is watching them out of order, and hence the need for this little digression. Now, the stories aren't really chronological in any sense of the word, but it helps if you know a little background, and it also gives me a chance to pontificate a little about Jim Corbett. So just for context, in the story of the Chowgard Tigers, Corbett mentioned of a district conference where the officials apprised him of the presence of three man-eating tigers operating at the same time in the Kumau and Gadwal divisions, sometime around mid to late 1920s. These were the Chaugar, the Mohan, and the Kanda man-eaters. Not to mention the fact that the Talla Des man-eater was also operating around the same time. But that's a different discussion altogether. Now, when you look at this map, what I've tried to do here is to mark Corbett's likely trail in a sequential way for the Kanda man-eater, and you'll see that the location of this particular hunt falls in the Garhwal division of the modern-day Uttarakhand state, somewhere along the northern boundary of the present-day Jim Corbett National Park. Now, most of Corbett's hunts took place in the Kumau division, which is the right half of this map, and continues all the way up until the border with Nepal. In fact, the place that's called Kanda, or Kanda village that's mentioned in the story, could have been an assembly of villages way back in Corbett's times, that have probably since been resettled and rehabilitated to somewhere outside the boundaries of the Jim Corbett National Park after its creation. So if you look at numbers 6 and 7, by following the key on your left, uh, that's where the Kanda Forest and the Kanda Forest Rest House is located, where Jim presumably stayed during his hunt. And number 8 is where the tiger was killed, Again, presumably. The forest department has built a plaque at that spot, and I think it's about a mile from the Kanda Forest Rest House. I say presumably because there is some dispute amongst Corbett's fans and enthusiasts about the exact location. Now we get to the fun part. Consider the contents of a public appeal sent to Jim Corbett from the villagers of a few different putties from the Kanda area. Puttis in the local dialect are a group of villages. I will read the contents of the petition now. I have made minor edits to the sentence structure of the petition to make it slightly more palatable without altering its core message. From the public of Patti Painon, Bungi and Bikla Badalpur, District Garhwal, to Captain James Edward Corbett, Kala Dungi, District Nainital. We, the public of the above three parties, wish to lay out the following few lines for your consideration. That in this vicinity, a tiger has turned out man-eater since last December. Up to this date, he has killed five men and wounded two. So we, the public, are in great distress. By the fear of this tiger, we cannot watch our wheat crop at night so the deers have nearly ruined it. We cannot go in the forest for fodder grass, nor can we enter our cattle in the forest to graze, so many of our cattle are left to die. Under these circumstances, we are nearly to be ruined. The forest officials are doing every possible arrangement to kill this tiger, but there is no hope of any success. Two shikari gentlemen also tried to shoot it, but unfortunately they could not get it. Our kind district magistrate has notified rupees 150 as reward for killing this tiger. So everyone is trying to kill it, but no success so far. We have heard that you have killed many man-eating tigers and leopards. 
for this you have earned a good name, especially in the Kumau Revenue Division. The famous man-eating leopard of Rudraprayag has been shot by you. This is the voice of all the public here, that this tiger will also be killed only by you. So we, the public, venture to request that you come to this place and shoot this tiger, our enemy, and save us from this calamity. For this act of kindness, we will be highly obliged to you. The route to this place is as follows. Ramnagar to Sultan, Sultan to Lahachar, Lahachar to Kanda. If you will inform us to the date of your arrival at Ramnagar, we will send our men and cart to Ramnagar to meet you and accompany you. Signed, Govind Singh Negi, Headman, Village Charat, 18th of February, 1933. Now, what stands out immediately to me from this appeal is that even though the villagers write in the name of the public, their petition, instead of being addressed to an administrative body or to any official, is addressed to Jim Corbett. And perhaps it makes it stand out even more is when you consider the fact that the events described in this story and in the story of the Mohan man-eater took place when anti-colonial sentiments were boiling over and the Indian independence struggle in the form of the civil disobedience movement was ascendant. Even so, the villagers were willing to place their faith in Corbett. Also, how remarkable is it that the district magistrate was willing to offer a bounty and place a reward over the killing of a tiger? Again, this is indicative of the unique position that Corbett occupied in the hearts and minds of the public, from the examples he had set and from the goodwill he had generated through his actions. Despite being so well connected to the center of power in Delhi, Corbett was the son of the land and was looked upon as one of their own. While there is no doubt that Corbett's hunting exploits had earned him some powerful friends who were part of the British colonial machinery, yet he maintained close liaisons with the local people throughout his life. He had a close rapport with not just the wilderness, but also with the villagers. Now, make what you will about all this, but to me this is one of those reasons why Jim Corbett's legend is still so firmly entrenched in the Kumau and Garhwal hinterland. And this fact becomes even more apparent towards the latter part of the story, when Colonel Corbett recounts the story of the old man and his son. That's when we see less of Jim Corbett, the hunter of man-eaters, and more of Jim Corbett, the person that he was. Anyway, enjoy the story. The Kanda Man-Eater by Jim Corbett Recording by Apratim Viraj Singh However little faith we have in the superstitions we share with others, thirteen at a table, the passing of wine at dinner, walking under a ladder, and so on, our own private superstitions, though a source of amusement to our friends, are very real to us. I do not know if sportsmen are more superstitious than the rest of mankind, but I do know that they take their superstitions very seriously. One of my friends invariably takes five cartridges, never more and never less, when he goes out after big game, and another as invariably takes seven cartridges. Another, who incidentally was the best-known big game sportsman in northern India, never started the winter shooting season without first killing a masir. My own private superstition concerns snakes. When after man-eaters, I have a deep-rooted conviction that, however much I may try, all my efforts will be unavailing until I have first killed a snake. During the hottest days of one May, I had from dawn to dark climbed innumerable miles up and down incredibly steep hills, and through thick thorn bushes that had left my hands and knees a mass of ugly scratches, in search of a very wary man-eater. I returned on that fifteenth of evening, dog-tired, to the two-roomed forest bungalow I was staying at to find a deputation of villagers waiting for me 
with the very welcome news that the man-eater, a tiger, had been seen that day on the outskirts of their village. It was too late to do anything that night, so the deputation were provided with lanterns and sent home with strict injunctions that no one was to leave the village the following day. The village was situated at the extreme end of the ridge on which the bungalow was, and because of its isolated position and the thick forest that surrounded it had suffered more from the depredations of the tiger than any other village in the district. The most recent victims were two women and a man. I had made one complete circle of the village the following morning and had done the greater part of a second circle, a quarter of a mile below the first, when after negotiating a difficult scree of shale, I came on a little nala made by the rush of rainwater down the steep hillside. A glance up and down the nala satisfied me that the tiger was not in it, and then a movement just in front of me and about twenty-five feet away caught my eye. At this spot there was a small pool of water the size of a bathtub, and on the far side of it was a snake that had evidently been drinking. The lifting of the snake's head had caught my eye, and it was not until the head had been raised some two or three feet from the ground, and the hood expanded, that I realized it was a hamadryad. It was the most beautiful snake I had ever seen. The throat, as it faced me, was a deep orange-red shading to golden yellow, where the body met the ground. The back olive green, was banded by ivory-colored chevrons, and some four feet of its length from the tip of its tail upwards was shiny black with white chevrons. In length the snake was between thirteen and fourteen feet. One hears many tales about hamadryads, their aggressiveness when disturbed, and the speed at which they can travel. If, as it seemed about to do, the snake attacked, up or down hill, I should be at a disadvantage. But across the shale scree, I felt that I could hold my own. A shot at the expanded hood, the size of a small plate, would have ended the tension, but the rifle in my hands was a heavy one, and I had no intention of disturbing the tiger that had showed up after so many days of weary waiting and toil. After an interminably long minute, during which time the only movement was the flicking in and out of a long and quivering forked tongue. The snake closed its hood, lowered his head to the ground, and turning, made off up the opposite slope. Without taking my eyes off him, I groped with my hand on the hillside and picked up a stone that filled my hand as comfortably as a cricket ball. The snake had just reached a sharp ridge of hard clay when the stone launched with the utmost energy I was capable of, struck it on the back of the head. The blow would have killed any other snake outright, but the only and very alarming effect it had on the hammer dryad was to make it whip round and come straight towards me. A second and a larger stone fortunately caught it on the neck when it had covered half the distance between us, and after that the rest was easy. With a great feeling of satisfaction, I completed the second circle round the village, and though it proved as fruitless as the first, I was elated at having killed the snake. Now, for the first time in many days, I had a feeling that my search for the man-eater would be successful. The following day, I again searched the forest surrounding the village, and towards evening found the fresh pug marks of the tiger at the edge of a ploughed field overlooking the village. The occupants of the village, numbering about a hundred, were by now thoroughly alarmed, and leaving them with the assurance that I would return early next day, I set out on my lonely four-mile walk back to the forest bungalow. To walk with safety through forests or along deserted roads in an area in which a man-eater is operating calls for the utmost caution, and the strict observance of many rules. It is only when the hunter has repeatedly been the hunted that the senses can be attuned to the required pitch, and those rules be strictly adhered to, the breaking of which would provide the man-eater with an easy victim. The reader may ask, why a lonely walk? 
when I probably had men and to spare with me in the camp? My answer to this very natural question would be, first, because one is apt to get careless and rely too much on one's companions, and second, because in a mix-up with a tiger, one has a better chance when one is alone. The next morning, as I approached the village, I saw an eager throng of men waiting for me, and when I was within earshot, I was greeted with the gratifying news that a buffalo had been killed during the night. The animal had been killed in the village, and after being dragged some distance along the ridge, had been taken down into a narrow, deep, and very heavily wooded valley on the north face of the hill. A very careful reconnaissance from a projecting rock on the ridge satisfied me that an approach down the steep hill along the line of the drag would not be advisable, and that the only thing to do was to make a wide detour, enter the valley from the lower end, and work up to the spot where I expected to find the kill. This maneuver was successfully accomplished, and by midday I had arrived at the spot, marked from above, where the valley flattened out for a hundred yards before going straight up three hundred yards to the ridge above. It was at the upper end of this flat bit of ground that I expected to find the kill, and with luck, the tiger. The long and difficult climb up the valley through dense thickets of thorn bush and stunted bamboo had brought out a bath of sweat, and, as it was not advisable to take on a job, where quick firing might be necessary with sweaty hands, I sat down for a much-needed rest and for a smoke. The ground in front of me was strewn with large, smooth boulders, among which a tiny stream meandered, forming, wherever possible, small crystal-clear pools. Shod with the thinnest of rubber-soled shoes, the going over these boulders was ideal for my purpose, and when I had cooled and dried, I set off to stalk the kill in the hope of finding the tiger lying asleep near it. When three-quarters of the ground had been covered, I caught sight of the kill tucked away under a bank of ferns and about twenty-five yards away from where the hill went steeply up to the ridge. The tiger was not in sight, and very cautiously, drawing level with the kill, I took up my position on a flat boulder to scan every inch of ground visible. The premonition of impending danger is too well known and established a fact to need any comment. For three or four minutes I had stood perfectly still, with no thought of danger, and then, all at once, I became aware that the tiger was looking at me at a very short range. The same sense that had conveyed the feeling of impending danger to me had evidently operated in the same way on the tiger and awakened him from his sleep. To my left front were some dense bushes, growing on a bit of flat ground. On these bushes, distant fifteen to twenty feet from me, and about the same distance from the kill, my interest centered. Presently the bushes were gently stirred, and the next second I caught sight of the tiger going at full speed up the steep hillside. Before I could get the rifle to bear on him, he disappeared behind a creeper-covered tree, and it was not until he had covered about sixty yards that I again saw him as he was springing up the face of a rock. At my shot, he fell backwards and came roaring down the hill, bringing an avalanche of stones with him. A broken back, I concluded, and just as I was wondering how best to deal with him when he should arrive all of a heap at my feet, the roaring ceased, and the next minute, as much to my relief as to my disappointment, I saw him going full out, and apparently unwounded, across the side of the hill. The momentary glimpses I caught of him offered no shot worth taking, and with a crash through some dry bamboos, he disappeared round the shoulder of the hill into the next valley. I subsequently found that my bullet fired at an angle of seventy-five degrees, had hit the tiger on the left elbow and chipped out a section from that bone which some cynical humorist has named the funny bone. Carrying on, the bullet had struck the rock and splashing back had delivered a smashing blow on the point of the jaw. Neither wound, however painful it may have been, was fatal, and the only result of my following up the very light blood trail into the next valley 
was to be growled at from a dense thorn thicket, to enter which would have been suicidal. My shot had been heard in the village, and an expectant crowd were waiting for me on the ridge. They were even more disappointed, if that were possible, than I was at the failure of my carefully planned and as carefully executed stock. On visiting the kill the following morning, I was very pleased and not a little surprised to find that the tiger had returned to it during the night and taken a light meal. The only way now of getting a second shot was to sit up over the kill and here a difficulty presented itself. There were no suitable trees within convenient distance of the kill, and the very unpleasant experience I had had on a former occasion had effectively cured me of sitting at night on the ground for a man-eater. While still undecided where to sit, I heard the tiger call some distance down the valley up which I had climbed the previous day. The calling of the tiger offered me a very welcome chance of shooting it in the most pleasant way it is possible of bringing one of these animals to bag. The conditions under which a tiger can be called up are a. When rampaging through the forest in search of a mate and b. When lightly wounded. It goes without saying that the sportsman must be able to call sufficiently well to deceive the tiger and that the call must come from a spot to which the tiger will quite naturally come, a dense thicket or a patch of heavy grass, and that the sportsman must be prepared to take his shot at a very close range. I am quite certain that many sportsmen will be sceptical of the statement I have made that a lightly wounded tiger will come to a call. I would ask all such to reserve their judgment until they have tried to experiment for themselves. On the present occasion, however, although the tiger answered me call for call, for upwards of an hour, he refused to come any nearer, and I attribute my failure to the fact that I was calling from the spot where the previous day the tiger had met with an unfortunate experience. The tree I finally selected was growing on the very edge of a perpendicular bank, and had a convenient branch about eight feet from the ground. When sitting on this branch, I should be thirty feet from, and directly above, the boulder-strewn ravine, up which I expected the tiger to come. The question of the tree settled, I returned to the ridge, where I had instructed my men to meet me with breakfast. By four o'clock in the evening, I was comfortably seated on the branch, and prepared for a long and a hard sit-up. Before leaving my men, I had instructed them to coo to me from the ridge at sunrise next morning. If I answered with the call of a leopard, they were to sit tight, but if they received no answer, they were to form two parties with as many villagers as they could collect and come down on either side of the valley, shouting and throwing stones. I have acquired the habit of sleeping in any position on a tree and as I was tired the evening did not pass unpleasantly. As the setting sun was gliding the hilltops above me, I was roused to full consciousness by the alarm call of a langur. I soon located the monkey sitting in a treetop on the far side of the valley, and as it was looking in my direction, I concluded that it had mistaken me for a leopard. The alarm call was repeated at short intervals, and finally ceased as darkness came on. Hour after hour, I strained my eyes and ears, and was suddenly startled by a stone rolling down the hillside and striking my tree. The stone was followed by the stealthy padding of a heavy, soft-footed animal, unmistakably the tiger. At first, I comforted myself with the thought that his coming in this direction, instead of going up the valley, was accidental, but this thought was soon dispelled when he started to emit low deep growls from immediately behind me. Quite evidently, he had come into the valley while I was having breakfast, and taking up a position on the hill where the monkey had later seen him, had watched me climbing into the tree. Here was a situation that I had not counted on, and one that needed careful handling. The branch that had provided a comfortable seat while daylight lasted admitted of little change of position in the dark. I could, of course, have fired off my rifle into the air, 
but the terrible results I have seen following an attempt to drive away a tiger at very close quarters by discharging a gun dissuaded me from taking this action. Further, even if the tiger had not attacked, the discharge of the rifle, a point four fifty four hundred, so near him would probably have made him leave the locality and all my toil would have gone for nothing. I knew the tiger would not spring, for that would have carried him straight down a drop of thirty feet onto the rocks below. But there was no need for him to spring, for by standing on his hind legs he could easily reach me. Lifting the rifle off my lap and reversing it, I pushed the barrel between my left arm and side, depressing the muzzle and slipping up the safety catch as I did so. This movement was greeted by a deeper growl than any that had preceded it. If the tiger now reached up for me, he would, in all likelihood, come in contact with the rifle, round the triggers of which my fingers were crooked, and even if I failed to kill him, the confusion following on my shot would give me a sporting chance of climbing higher into the tree. Time dragged by on leaden feet, and eventually, tiring of prowling about the hillside and growling, the tiger sprang across a little ravine on my left, and a few minutes later I heard the welcome sound of a bone being cracked at the kill. At last, I was able to relax in my uncomfortable position, and the only sounds I heard for the rest of the night came from the direction of the kill. The sun had been up but a few minutes, and the valley was still in deep shadow, when my men cooed from the ridge, and almost immediately afterwards I caught sight of the tiger making off at a fast canter up and across the hill on my left. In the uncertain light, and with my night-long strained eyes, the shot was a very difficult one, but I took it, and had the satisfaction of seeing the bullet going home. Turning with a great roar, he came straight for my tree, and as he was in the act of springing the second bullet, with great good fortune, crashed into his chest. Diverted in his spring by the impact of the heavy bullet, the tiger struck the tree just short of me, and ricocheting off it, went headlong into the valley below, where his fall was broken by one of the small pools already alluded to. He floundered out of the water, leaving it dyed red with his blood, and went lumbering down the valley and out of sight. Fifteen hours on the hard branch had cramped every muscle in my body, and it was not until I had swarmed down the tree, staining my clothes in the great gouts of blood the tiger had left on it and had massaged my stiff limbs that I was able to follow him. He had gone but a short distance, and I found him lying dead at the foot of a rock in another pool of water. Contrary to my orders, the men collected on the ridge, hearing my shot and the tiger's roar, followed by a second shot, came in a body down the hill. Arrived at the blood-stained tree, at the foot of which my soft hat was lying, they not unnaturally concluded that I had been carried off by the tiger. Hearing their shouts of alarm, I called out to them, and again they came running down the valley, only to be brought up with a gasp of dismay when they saw my blood-stained clothes. Reassured that I was not injured and that the blood in my clothes was not mine, a moment later they were crowding round the tiger. A stout sapling was soon cut and lashed to him with creepers, and the tiger, with no little difficulty and a great deal of shouting, was carried up the steep hill to the village. In remote areas in which long-established man-eaters are operating, many gallant acts of heroism are performed, which the local inhabitants accept as everyday occurrences, and the outside world have no means of hearing about. I should like to put on record one such act concerning the Kanda man-eater's last human victim. I arrived on the scene shortly after the occurrence, and from the details supplied by the villagers, and from a careful examination of the ground, which had not been disturbed in the interval, I am able to present you with a story which I believe to be correct in every detail. In the village, near which I shot the Kanda man-eater, lived an elderly man and his only son. The father had served in the army during the 1914-18 war, 
and it was his ambition to get his son enlisted in the Royal Gadwal Rifles. Not as simple a job in the piping days of peace, when vacancies were few and applicants many, as it is today. Shortly after the lad's eighteenth birthday, a party of men passed through the village on their way to the bazaar at Lansdowne. The lad joined this party, and immediately on arrival at Lansdowne, presented himself at the recruiting office. As his father had taught him to salute with military precision, and how to conduct himself in the presence of a recruiting officer, he was accepted without any hesitation, and after enrollment, he was given leave to deposit his few personal possessions at home before starting his army training. He arrived back home at about midday, after an absence of five days, and was told by the friends who thronged round him to hear his news that his father was away, ploughing their small holding at the extreme end of the village and would not return before nightfall. The field that was being ploughed was the same one on which I had seen the pug marks of the man-eater the day I had killed the hammer-dryad. One of the lad's jobs had been to provide fodder for their cattle, and after he had partaken of the midday meal in a neighbor's house, he set out with a party of twenty men to collect leaves. The village, as I have told you, is situated on a ridge, and is surrounded by forests. Two women had already been killed by the man-eater while cutting grass in these forests, and for several months the cattle had been kept alive on leaves cut from the trees surrounding the village. Each day the men had to go further afield to get their requirements, and on this particular day the party of twenty-one, after crossing the cultivated land, went for a quarter of a mile down a very steep rocky hill to the head of the valley which runs east for eight miles through dense forest to where it meets the Ramganga River opposite the Thikala forest bungalow. At the head of the valley, the ground is more or less flat and overgrown with big trees. Here the men separated, each climbing into a tree of his choice, and after cutting the quantity of leaves required, they tied them into bundles with rope brought for the purpose and returned to the village in twos and threes. Either when the party of men were coming down the hill, talking at the tops of their voices to keep up their courage and scare away the man-eater, or when they were on the trees shouting to each other, the tiger, who was lying up in a dense patch of cover half a mile down the valley, heard them. Leaving the cover in which it had four days previously killed and eaten a somber hind, the tiger crossed a stream, and by way of a cattle track that runs the entire length of the valley, hurried up in the direction of the men. The speed at which a tiger has travelled over any ground on which he has left signs of his passage can be easily determined from the relative position of his fore and hind pug marks. The lad of my story had selected a bohemia tree from which to cut leaves for his cattle. This tree was about twenty yards above the cattle track, and the upper branches were leaning out over a small ravine in which there were two rocks. From a bend in the cattle track the tiger saw the lad on the tree, and after lying down and watching him for some time it left the track and concealed itself behind a fallen silk cotton tree some thirty yards from the ravine. When the lad had cut all the leaves he needed, he descended from the tree and collected them in a heap preparatory to tying them into a bundle. While doing this on the open flat ground he was comparatively safe, but, unfortunately, he had noticed that two of the branches he had cut had fallen into the ravine between the two big rocks, and he sealed his fate by stepping down into the ravine to recover them. As soon as he was out of sight, the tiger left the shelter of the fallen tree and crept forward to the edge of the ravine, and as the lad was stooping down to pick up the branches, it sprang on him and killed him. Whether the killing took place while the other men were still on the trees, or after they had left, it was not possible for me to determine. The father of the lad returned to the village at sunset, and was greeted with the very gratifying news that his son had been accepted for the army, and that he had returned from Lansdowne on short leave. Asking where the lad was, he was told that he had gone out earlier in the day to get fodder, 
and surprise was expressed that the father had not found him at home. After bedding down the bullocks, the father went from house to house to find his son. All the men who had been out that day were questioned in turn, and all had the same tale to tell, that they had separated at the head of the valley, and that no one could remember having seen the lad after that. Crossing the terraced, cultivated land, the father went to the edge of the steep hill, and called, and called again to his son, but received no answer. Night was by now setting in. The man returned to his home and lit a small, smoke-dimmed lantern, and as he passed through the village, he horrified his neighbors by telling them, in reply to their questions, that he was going to look for his son. He was asked if he had forgotten the man-eater, and answered that it was because of the man-eater that he was so anxious to find his son, for it was possible that he had fallen off a tree and injured himself, and for fear of attracting the man-eater had not answered to his call. He did not ask anyone to accompany him, and no one offered to do so, and for the whole of that night he surged up and down that valley in which no one had dared to set foot since the advent of the man-eater. Four times during the night, as I saw from his footprints, when going along the cattle track he had passed within ten feet of where the tiger was lying eating his son. Weary and heartsick, he climbed a little way up the rocky hill as light was coming and sat down for a rest. From this raised position he could see into the ravine. At sunrise he saw a glint of blood on the two big rocks, and hurrying down to the spot he found all that the tiger had left of his son. These remains he collected and took back to his home, and when a suitable shroud had been procured, his friends helped him to carry the remains to the burning cot on the banks of the Mundal River. I do not think it would be correct to assume that acts such as these are performed by individuals who lack imagination and who therefore do not realize the grave risks they run. The people of our hills, in addition to being very sensitive to their environments, are very superstitious, and every hilltop, valley, and gorge is credited with possessing a spirit in one form or another, all of the evil and malignant kind most to be feared during the hours of darkness. A man, brought up in these surroundings, and menaced for over a year by a man-eater, who, unarmed and alone, from sunset to sunrise, could walk through dense forests, which his imagination peopled with evil spirits, and in which he had every reason to believe a man-eater was lurking, was in my opinion possessed of a quality and a degree of courage that is given to few. All the more do I give him credit for his act of heroism for not being conscious that he had done anything unusual or worthy of notice. When at my request he sat down near the man-eater to enable me to take a photograph, he looked up at me and said, in a quiet and collected voice, I am content now, Sahib, for you have avenged my son. This was the last of the three man-eaters that I had promised the district officials of Kumau, and later the people of Garhwal that I would do my best to rid them off. The End